So we always like to start our telecom calls out with a message from our director, John Rohr. Uh, Mr. Rohr. Hey, Dave. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, this week, VA is hosting a nationwide impact at week of action to inform veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors about the PACT Act and a coordinated outreach effort to encourage as many as possible to apply for the toxic disclosure-related health care and benefits that they've earned. The PACT Act is a new law officially titled the Sergeant First Class Pete Robinson Honoring Our Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxic Act, so PACT Act. And it represents perhaps the largest expansion of health care and benefits in VA's history. The PACT Act expands and extends eligibility for VA health care for veterans with toxic exposures and veterans of the Vietnam, Gulf War, and post-9-11 era. It adds more than 20 presumptive conditions for burn pit, Agent Orange, and other toxic exposures. It requires VA to provide toxic exposure screening to every veteran enrolled in VA healthcare and helps VA improve research, staff education, and treatment related to toxic exposures. And it expands benefits available for illnesses resulting from toxic exposure. When veterans served our country, many were exposed to toxic hazards. For too long, veterans and their survivors were not able to access toxic related benefits service, including many Vietnam era, Gulf War era, and post-9-11 vets. The PACT Act changes that, and it expands our ability to provide services to address these conditions. We know there are millions of veterans and survivors across America who are eligible for new health care and benefits as a result of the PACT Act, and we are making every effort to ensure broad understanding of what the PACT Act includes and offers so that everyone who is covered understands how they can access the benefits and services that they've earned for their service. Today, we want to ensure all of you take action to explore your eligibility. Here are five things we want to make sure all veterans know about this new law. First, we are just encouraging veterans to apply for PACT Act benefits and care right now. Second, VBA, the Veterans Benefits Administration will begin processing veteran claims for PACT Act compensation on January 1st. We encourage you to work with your county veteran service officer or through the Veterans Benefits Administration to submit your claim as soon as possible. Number three, some veterans worry that applying for benefits under the PACT Act will negatively impact their existing benefits. The truth is that there's a 97% chance your benefits will either increase or they'll stay the same when submitting your application. Four, there are people out there working to convince veterans to use a lawyer to apply for VA benefits. This is simply not needed and could result in a diversion of the benefits you've earned to pay for unnecessary legal fees. Applying for PAC Act benefits is free, and you can do it working directly with your county veteran service officer, your veteran service organization, or through the VBA, the Veterans Benefits Administration. And then five, you can learn more about the PACT Act. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, and you can also apply by visiting www.va.gov backslash PACT, P-A-C-T, or just by calling the 1-800-MY-VA-411 number, which is also 800-698-2419. Thank you again for your attention today and for joining the call. Please don't wait. We really want you to explore your eligibility for the PACT Act benefits today. And importantly, tell a fellow veteran who may not be connected with the VA about this opportunity. Back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Director Rohr, for all of that great information about the PACT Act and what veterans, caregivers, and spouses can do today to explore their eligibility. We want to re reiterate those contacts for all on the call. Uh, the website for PACT Act information is www.va.gov backslash PACT, and the phone number is 1-800-MY-VA-411 or 800-698-2411. With all of the commercials and class action lawsuits uh, to claim benefits, we want to reiterate that applying for benefits under the PACT Act is free. 
We encourage you to explore your benefits today and share with others what you can learn. Um, next, I want to introduce Dr. Ryan Marsh, our clinical subject matter expert, who's coordinating our efforts to manage initial toxic, toxic exposure screening and follow-up care. He's with us on the call today to provide you with an update on what to expect regarding the new required toxic exposure screen. Dr. Marsh. Hey, thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks so much for having me here today. As Director Rohr said, the PACT Act is comprehensive legislation, which is a great first step for the VA to address the many concerns veterans have about their military exposures and the potential adverse health effects these may cause in the future. While we don't have all the answers yet, we are dedicated to working with each veteran about any symptoms or conditions they have as these relate to exposures and connect them with the appropriate resource that can best assist. The toxic exposure screening of every enrolled veteran that is required by the PACT Act started on November 8th, and we have already done over 4,000 of them. Before your primary care appointment, the nursing staff will ask if you believe you've experienced any toxic exposures, including open burn pits, airborne hazards, Gulf War-related exposures, Agent Orange, radiation, Camp Lejeune, or any other exposures. This will give you an opportunity to report any concerns you might have, which will then prompt further screening either by your primary care provider or environmental health staff. This will give you the opportunity to have further conversations about any issues and, again, allow us to connect you with resources such as the Registry Clinic, the Veterans Benefits Administration, Toxic Exposure Navigators, or your County Veterans Service Officer. There could also be further testing or treatment if indicated by your primary care provider or a specialist if needed. We hope to use this screening process as a starting point to addressing any toxic exposures you may have experienced. All right, now we're opening the floor up to questions. Um, but while, <clears throat> before we do that, we want to learn a little bit from you. Oh, well, we'll, we'll go to questions and answers now. Um, the first question will be from, uh, let's see, Alan Nielsen. Uh, Alan, you have a, a question about the PAC guy. Go ahead with your question. Uh, good afternoon. I was just wondering how I would apply for the extra benefits. So your question is, how do you apply for PAC Act related benefits? Are you enrolled in VA healthcare already, or are getting compensation and pension benefits? Uh, both of the above. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Um, hi, is it? Alan. Hi, Alan. This is Kelly. I work in the social work department. Um, in regard to your question, are you referring to service-connected compensation? Uh, yes, I was in Vietnam. I was all over the country, exposed to Agent Orange. Uh, I was uh, in Benoit for several months where uh, the burning of the feces uh, occurred multiple times a day. Uh, and I lost a friend, a master sergeant, uh, not too long ago, who had uh, multiple tours in Vietnam, and he could not understand how anybody who was in country for any length of time would not be uh, on the list of exposure to Agent Orange. And uh, okay. I have, I was diagnosed with uh, some type of lung cancer at one point that uh, just mysteriously went away, and I'm attributing that to my genes, uh, n nothing else other than that, uh, but mainly a website that I could apply for the benefit? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, my suggestion, my first suggestion would be reaching out to your county veteran service office. So whatever county you live in, there's a county veteran service office there. They can help yes. you apply for any service connection. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Frederick. The next call, the next uh, question we have comes from Glenn in Watertown. Um, Glenn, please go ahead with your question. Uh, does the PACT Act cover the exposure to um, all the toxic chemicals and everything that uh, we were exposed to with the, uh, the oil well fires? Because there were some areas where we were at where we could see, uh, you know, a hundred of the wells that were that were burning and 
the cloud of smoke just went over us and there was oil like all over the ground and I'm wondering if it's covered under that as well. Yeah, this, this is Dr. Marsh. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that would be something that uh, the PACT Act is looking to address as well as the registry. So if, if you haven't joined the uh, Airborne Hazards Registry, that would be uh, something that you would be eligible for as well. Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate that question. Um, we're waiting for the next question and we'll just queue it up here. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's go to James. James from Whitewater, you had a question about uh, additional benefits under the PACT Act. Go ahead with your question. My question was, I was in Vietnam and I wasn't stationed to a unit yet, so I was on uh, guard duty and also had to burn feces or pull out five gallon barrels and put diesel fuel in them, 55 gallon drums and burn manure for over a month over there. I spent that all the time over there. And as far as Agent Orange, I was sprayed at least twice with Agent Orange, but I do get 60% for Agent Orange. But uh, I also had open heart surgery and everything else. And I was just wondering if there was anything else I could apply for. Yeah, hey, this is Dr. Marsh. So there were a couple uh, conditions that were added as presumptive conditions. So those. Uh, as part of the PACT Act. So a presumptive condition is a condition that if you have that diagnosis and you served in a certain area at a certain time, you would get service connection for it. So high blood pressure, so also called hypertension, and then um, MGUS, which is mono, uh, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. That's something you probably have to figure out from your doctor, uh, but that would be something else. And then there are certainly a lot of other conditions uh, that are presumptive conditions and can be related to uh, Agent Orange exposures or the exposures that you had uh, through the uh, airborne uh, exposures uh, uh, in, in Vietnam as well. So talking with your county veteran service officer would be a great starting point uh, and uh, seeing if maybe you have any of those conditions. We also certainly have uh, the Agent Orange uh, registry exam. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the next question we have uh, uh, comes from Wayne uh, in Bossville. Wayne, you have a question about community care. Yeah, uh, uh, I was in Vietnam 22 months, and I live about 80, 85 miles from the Madison VA, and there is no clinics around here. And it's, sometimes it's hard to get get that far, especially in the winter time. Is there any way they could have a clinic? Closer to bot, uh, my hometown. Um, it, just wondering if that was a possibility or what. Yeah, Wayne. This is uh, John, the director. We 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 have looked all uh, throughout our catchment area, and our our goal is always to try and put clinics within a 30 minute driving range for people for primary care. Uh, that's sort of the way we established our clinics. But of course, it also we look at the population of the area. So, how many veterans are we going to be able to cover? And so, we kind of have the coverage that we're going to have in our clinics for the foreseeable future. So, so unfortunately, we we will not be placing a clinic nearer uh, the Bosville area. However, you know we do have community care, and and for those veterans who cannot reach the VA. Uh, in those parameters, uh, you can request that you be seen at a uh, uh, a private facility, a non-VA facility at the VA's uh, cost. So um, if the if the travel time is too arduous for you, then that is what I would recommend. And if you're already established with us, then that's just a a, a conversation that you have with your primary care provider, or I don't know, Rochelle. Hello. I was going to add, this is for Shelly, Chief of Primary Care, that for some of our veterans that live a ways away and have established care here, um, we do do video visits or phone visits with them. Um, and that's a great way, especially in the winter time, to be able to stay connected uh, with your primary care provider and your PAC team. Yep, yeah. those are all excellent recommendations. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Lanny. Uh, Lanny, I want to go ahead with your question. 
Hello. I was wondering if I'm traveling in the country and I get hurt or need hospitalization and there's no VA hospital around, uh, am I responsible for the bill? Okay. Um, hi, this is Pam from the Eligibility Office. Am I understanding your question correctly that you're asking if you need emergency care while traveling and you're not close to a VA? Is that what you're asking, sir? Yes, yes sir, ma'am. Okay. So that would fall under uh, the Mission Act uh, where if you seek emergency care away from the VA, you have 72 hours from that emergency treatment to notify the VA of that care in order to have the ability to file a claim with the VA. That falls under the mission expert. So you would go, if it's a true emergency, you would go to the closest emergency room that can stabilize you and then notify the VA. Thank you very much for that, and thank you, Pam. Uh, the next question we have is from Roy. Roy, are you on the line? Yes, sir. My name is Roy Adams. I live in Wazika, and I'm wondering how I was in Desert Storm being exposed. <coughs> <coughs> To the oil fires and the burn pits of human waste, if I'm entitled. Yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Hey, this is Dr. Marsh. Absolutely. Uh, those are covered. So uh, again, either going to the uh, getting a registry exam or making a claim, uh, starting with your county veteran service office officer is always a good uh, a good starting point. Yeah, that, that, that's a great uh, question, and, and I think you'll hear some of us repeating the same answers as far as if any of these conditions apply to you. Uh, we're really just encouraging you to reach out uh, to your county veteran service officer, reach out to uh, one of your local veteran service organization representatives, and just explore your eligibility. We're really encouraging everybody to do that because a lot of these conditions that people are bringing up are exactly what the PACT Act is designed to cover. Um, the next question we have uh, comes from John. Uh, John, you had a question about Camp Lejeune. Yes. And I, hello there. Um, my husband was in Camp Lejeune for seven mo uh, six months in 1970. We called about it, and because he has not been diagnosed with cancer <coughs> or Parkinson's, which he has the shakes, but because he hasn't been uh, diagnosed yet, they said that we, he didn't qualify. Can you tell me why? Hi, this is Pam from Eligibility again. Um, can I ask what he's trying to gain eligibility for? Is it health care in general? Well, no, he's 100% disabled <laughs> uh, through the VA. But okay, Camp Lejeune in itself is an eligibility for VA health care. It's self-declared by a veteran. If he's 100% <coughs> service accepted um, and already enrolled, um, there are presumed conditions for the exposures in Camp Lejeune as well. Um, what is it exactly he was looking to see is he eligible for? No. We just got called. We we just I just put his name in and we just got called. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> well, there are a lot of other benefits that are available for Camp Lejeune exposed exposure. So again, where you may want to check with the local uh, county vet service officer to see all that apply. Okay, the next question we have um, comes from Nick. You had a question about symptoms, Nick. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I was just curious what kind of like chronic symptoms to look out for to indicate that I have lasting effects from toxic exposure from uh, open burn pits specifically. 
Hey, so this is Dr. Moore. So there's a lot of them. Uh, I'd say the most common ones are going to be allergic rhinitis, so runny nose, uh, asthma, uh, so shortness of breath, um, coughing, uh, and then sinusitis. Those are some of the more typical ones. Uh, there are a lot of new presumptive conditions. Uh, so that's, that's a really good conversation to have with your primary care provider as well uh, to explore any conditions that you might have. And then if they come up with any diagnoses, especially if those are uh, on our presumptive list, to, to go ahead and make a claim for that as well. I think we want to emphasize that there's a, a couple steps to this process. So a lot of you have asked about, am I eligible? And, and yes, I mean, you're certainly eligible. But then, then you have to apply for that claim. And so, so make sure that you're, you're going through all of the steps. And that's why we keep saying your county veteran service officer would be so helpful because they do this on a day-to-day -day basis. We certainly can answer your questions here at the hospital and eligibility in other areas, but that county veteran service officer or a direct call with the VBA, um, they can really walk you through all the steps. Thank you very much. The next question we have is from uh, Janice. Janice, you had a question about uh, increases in benefit rates. Go ahead, Janice. Well, we can read Janice's question. She was, Janice is asking a question that I think is probably a, on a lot of people's minds, which is about increases uh, in either compensation rates or in uh, any travel rates. Um, and uh, that, that's front and center uh, while we're dealing kind of in an inflationary economy. So I'm sure many people are concerned about the same thing. I, I don't know that we have any information about uh, increases to benefit allocations at this point. That's certainly nothing that's uh, within our local control. Um, that is something that when we're notified of either uh, increases uh, that Congress passes to uh, either the travel benefit um, or other benefits, um, uh, we're made aware of, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, updates uh, on either of those topics. Uh, and I would imagine the BBA, if there were any uh, increases, the BBA contacts, you're, anytime you have anybody that you know in veterans' benefits, they'd be able to answer. The next question we have is from Tim. Uh, Tim, you have a question about community care. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, great to hear all the other questions out there and welcome home to those Vietnam vets. Uh, my question is in regards to uh, community care. Recently had a knee replacement and there was a gap to get physical therapy started of about two weeks because somebody was out of office from that from the community care office. And then after I went through several weeks of visits, which are much appreciated, um, it gapped another like couple of weeks until I got a reauthorization and uh, and that was only for six visits and then to shorten this a little bit uh, I needed to see a surgeon again for a follow-up appointment to get any further physical therapy uh, appointments and of course the surgeon was booked out for a month for that appointment which then you know delayed the whole progress and this is for a knee replacement which is pretty common I would need about three months worth of PT. So the question is, is there a system in place to help alleviate these gaps in uh, physical therapy, but then also to maybe extend it more than just like six visits a, a crack? Does that make sense? You know, number one, I just, thanks for bringing that up because the, the way that we hear about sometimes those gaps is by from our veterans selling us. And certainly, we uh, we have there is a, a, a normal number of physical therapy appointments and, and those things that are part of a package that we would approve. But then when you have to re-up that, you're right, you're back into that process, and it's a, it it can be a, a, a timely uh, the time frame can can get expanded more than we would like. Um, uh, <clears throat> hey, my name is Tim Hall. I am the mobility manager at the PS office. So I'm going to speak on some of the community care stuff. Um, the number one thing is um, we need, whenever you try to contact your nurse care manager, they're really good at passing all the information to your provider to help you to consult them all. If you are having uh, issues with uh, where you're at, whether it's something you need to contact the community care office or the dentist to get a schedule of appointment, they do have a new um, manager inside community care right now. They're going to be able to help out with that process and um, kind of speed things along. But you do also have the option of 
of contacting the CAS office. We do everything we can to try to help veterans get in contact with whoever they need to be able to um, get your consult and move along, and this will not give you information where you're at in the process. Thanks, Tim, for your question. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Karen. Karen, uh, you had a question about uh, PAC Act and Camp Lejeune uh, and a couple others. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, my question about Camp Lejeune is, well, I had, went, after three months getting there, I had a pelvic inflammatory disease. I was hospitalized. <laughs> For like five days with every organ infected and they just they don't know what happened which now we know and then two years later I got cancer but my question is you see all these commercials on TV with lawyers but then you said I should go through the CVSO um, but are they represent will they represent me or like it, will they represent the VA to try to disclaim my claim? You know, that's what I'm concerned about. I'm not. Hi, hi Karen. This is Kelly in the social work office. Um, so the county veteran service officers are all veterans themselves. And their job is to help veterans apply for these types of financial benefits. So they help you with the application. They make sure it gets to the right folks. Um, they're kind of your advocate throughout the process. So that's why we always recommend going through the county vet's office. And I, I, this is John again, the director. I'd just like to add, certainly I hear in your question some concern from many years past when it seemed like the VA was not listening to veterans who had these issues. I can tell you that with this passage of this PAC Act, that has really it, it turned 180 degrees. Everybody in the VA wants people who were exposed to these toxins to get the benefits that they deserve. So I just want to make that clear to everybody on the call. That, uh, that this is something that we are, the reason we're having this call and the reason they're happening all over the country this week is so that we get veterans what they deserve to have for what they gave to us. And I do see, Karen, you had another piece of that question I'm, and we'll just take it on here. If, uh, maybe Tim can look at that one. Yes, you had a question of does our VA have uh, psilocybin studies for PTSD anxiety, and addiction. Um, our partner next door, UW, does have some ongoing trials right now, specifically in psilocybin, also with depression. Um, we have met with them as recently as November, looking to specifically have veteran studies that would be with psilocybin and anxiety and PTSD. Um, so that is not yet something that is active, but probably would be a year from now. And in the meantime, there are studies at UW. If you looked at UW psilocybin, you would find some of those studies going on right now. Thank you very much, Jim, and thanks, Karen, for the question. Uh, the next question we have is from Edward in Pittsburgh, Wisconsin. Edward, you had a question about spousal benefits. Oh, Keith, I'm sorry. Keith Edward. Keith Edward, yes. Keith, are you still on the call with us? Oh, yes, I am. <clears throat> oh, excellent. Uh, yeah, we wanted to take your question about spousal benefits. Okay, yeah, that was uh, that was the uh, that was my second question. Uh, if, whenever I expire, because I'm a, I'm a recipient of a thirty percent. Disability. Uh, I'm a Vietnam vet. Uh, uh, I believe my um, um, my um, compensation was uh, because of Agent Orange. Um, but if and when I expire, and we all going to at some point in life, um, does my wife uh, is my wife uh, get uh, as a beneficiary of of my 
thing at a percentage of maybe it's only 50% of what I get. Sure. Hi, Keith. This is Kelly in the social work office. So that that is also a great question for the county veteran service officers. But there is a benefit that we call DIC. Um, for some veterans that are highly service connected, if the veteran passes away of a service connected condition, their surviving spouse is sometimes eligible for survivor benefits. So and it really depends on the percentage of service connection and the cause of death. So but there, that is, there is a benefit that exists like that. Um, I would suggest talking to the county vet service office a little bit more about that just to get more information. All right, thank you, Keith. And I, I wanted to make a correction because as we are doing this, sometimes we realize that we have more information than we think we do. And uh, while we were uh, considering the question about cost of living increases, uh, uh, Dr. Jurgen did a little bit of research and verified that uh, those are linked to Social Security for compensation <clears throat> and benefits. Um, and that 8.7 percentage for Social Security is the same that will pass for uh, VA compensation. So uh, thank you, Dr. Jurgen, for a little on-the-spot research there and for getting uh, our folks on the call uh, the right information. Um, our next uh, question comes from Ken. Ken, uh, proceed with your question, please. And Ken from Beaver Dam. Good afternoon. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm receiving compensation because of Agent Orange. Uh, a few years back, we submitted a claim for hypertension, and it was denied because at that time it was not part of the Agent Orange. Uh, I believe I'm going to be a accepted as uh, approved for hypertension in you know after January 1st I'm curious will I receive benefits back to the original date that I uh, submitted a claim which was denied um, so to answer that the only way you receive back pay to the date um, it was denied is if you have a fill open or you still have a file uh, open Otherwise, that will be um, you receive payment from the day that you were uh, awarded that stability. And again, I think the best advice is if you think you're now newly eligible, to proceed with the process and make sure that you're talking with your CDSO or your other uh, representative uh, who can advocate uh, for you. So this is Dr. Marshall. I think what they're saying is if they deny the claim, but it's now a presumptive condition. You have to file a supplemental claim, and then they'll review it again. I don't know if they're going to backdate it. So, but I, I don't, I don't, yeah, you're saying no. Yeah, so that part, I, I don't think so. But you do have to file a supplemental claim for that. But you will get it this time. So there have been a ton of great questions today. We really appreciate that. We want to pause for a second. And if you've been on our pause before, we do like to ask these polling questions just to get some feedback from all of you about, uh, you know, the information you're processing and to, to kind of understand um, where where you all are, are feeling about um, uh, some issues. So the first the question we have for you is, after listening to our call today, do you feel confident you know where to get information on the PAC Act? And if you could dial one on your phone, if you're confident, you know where to go. Two, if you're uncertain still. And three, if you're just confused. Because we know that sometimes government uh, regulations and programs can be confusing. Uh, so again, one, if you're confident that you know where to go to get information on the PAC Act. Uh, two, if you're uncertain still. And three, if you are confused. And we're seeing the responses come in, and about three quarters of you are saying you're confident you know where to go. Uh, about 20% uh, are saying that you're still uncertain, and then there's about 6% that are saying that you're still confused. We want to remind everybody that even if some of the information that we're providing on the call isn't perfectly clear to you, um, the best place to go to get uh, initial information on this is our website. And that's a national website, www.da.gov backslash PACT. 
And at that location, there is all of this information and some nice condensed bullet points. So if you have any questions at all after the call, that's a great first stop. Um, we also have uh, the phone number. If you prefer to call, that phone number is 800-MY-VA-411 or 800-698-2411. Uh, both are the best places to go if you have a follow-up question that's personal to you and you want to do a little bit more research. Uh, the second question we have for you is, are you aware of what actions you must take to apply for PAC Act healthcare or benefits? Uh, press one if you understand, press two if you feel like you still need more information. And thank you for the responses that are coming in. It seems like this one is pretty split between people that uh, understand uh, next steps and people that feel like they need more information. Um, so for those of you that are feeling like you need more information, um, you know, remember there are two different application processes here. One, if you're looking for healthcare benefits, you have to enroll in VA healthcare. Um, and if you're looking for compensation benefits, you have to apply for those benefits through VBA. I think a recurring thing that you've heard today is the most important thing to do is explore your eligibility by either going to the website or consulting with a county veteran service officer or other subject matter expert who can really help you navigate all of these questions and, um, and uh, get you set straight with the, the best next steps. So, and then if you happen to have an upcoming appointment, you can be screened when you come in. So just make sure you're thinking about that too. So. Uh, that would be helpful for you, I think, and then you would get some, get some additional information after that. All right, we can go back to your questions now. And uh, the next question we have is from Harley in Beloit. Hi, yeah, so I'm a younger veteran myself, but my grandfather was a Vietnam vet and I inherited quite a bit of his um, service gear that he came back with. Um, it sat in a barrel for about 40 some years before I got to it. And I'm concerned that I've inhaled some of the chemical compounds that were, um, in the fibers of the gear. Um, because he was a gunnery sergeant for the Marine Corps, uh, there in Vietnam for helicopter logistics and worked on some of the helicopters that sent out the Agent Orange and all the other chemicals. Uh, and then I personally served in the Marine Corps and I was wondering if for like air pollution and whatnot, um, I was wondering, like, are they going to determine that eligibility too for the PACT Act? Um, cause I serve, uh, when I was in, I went to MCRD San Diego for basic. And when I was there at the time, the, uh, the base is right next to the airport, and then on top of that, we also had the wildfires that were uh, blowing smoke and soot over the base from the other side of the mountain. Uh, hey, it's Dr. Marsh. So certainly understand your exposure concerns. I think that's a very specific question about the, the grandfather, and that would be something you'd have to explore either with the VBA or County Veteran Service Officer. I can say in general, definitely, if you served in uh, certain areas at certain times, uh, have eligibility for the airborne hazards, that uh, the airport exposures would be something uh, that would be included. So that, again, is uh, something to explore uh, with your county veteran service officer. All right, thank you very much. The next question we have is uh, from Walter in Randolph. Walter, what's your question? <laughs> Yeah. Walter, are you on the line? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead with your question, sir. I already asked it. I, I oh, did you already asked it? No, no. He did, yeah. Oh, okay. I agree. All right. So, Walter, your question for everybody else on the call is that you've applied for disability uh, and you're cur you currently have a 50% rating. Um, but the, your perception is that your condition keeps getting worse with the problems. Uh, the question is whether he, you're eligible for additional service-connected disability. 
Um, this is Pam with the hospital eligibility office again, and and it, and it sounds, and I think we've heard it many times throughout the uh, meeting today. Um, you can always go back to your local county vet service officer and and apply to either uh, put in a new claim or reopen a claim if a condition, if a new condition arises or a condition that you've already been granted a service connection worsens. Um, again, you'd have to go to the local county vet, vet service officer to find out more on that. But whatever, regardless of what your service rating is, if you're awarded that, the VA hospital will recognize it and treat it. All right, thank you. Um, before we go to the next question, uh, you know, I know that there have been a few different questions asked about, uh, you know, all these advertisements for attorneys um, and, uh, you know, other folks who are offering uh, veterans um, services to help them get benefits. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that we're providing all of you with important information about how to avoid PACT Act related scams um, that do target veterans um, that often are, are uh, intended to access PACT Act benefits on, their, on your behalf. Please do be cautious of anyone who guarantees financial benefits or services associated with these programs. Um, to help you identify potential scams, uh, VA is promoting um, some following tips just for all of you to stay safe. Um, do not provide personal benefits, medical, or financial details over the phone. Federal agencies will not contact you and ask for this information unless you make an inquiry. Um, we are encouraging you not to click on online ads or engage with social media that seems suspicious. Um, if you are engaging with a website, do check to make sure it has an HTTPS um, backslash backslash designation to confirm it's official. Do enable multi-factor authentication on all of your accounts. Do work with veteran service providers you already know and trust and people who are recommended like your county veteran service officer. If you are suspicious or <clears throat> that you've been a subject to any sort of fraud, submit that uh, fraud claim to ftc.gov or contact the VA OIG hotline. Remember, applying for VA benefits and services is free, and there are many official pathways to pursue, uh, to explore your eligibility for benefits and services. Um, again, uh, the best way to make sure that you're getting uh, direct information from the government is to go to our website, www.va.gov backslash PAC or call 800-MY-VA-411. Um, again, or work with a local uh, recognized subject matter expert um, in order to pursue your benefits. So we know there's a lot of misinformation out there. We really want to make sure everyone's careful and conscious of uh, the potential for fraud that this does exist out there. Okay, we'll go back to questions. Uh, the next question we have is from Don in Wahan. Hi, this is Don. I spent a year in Vietnam on control on patrols, and I feel like I was probably near areas where they used Agent Orange, and I remember uh, getting drinking water from uh, bomb craters and then using purification tablets, but I don't have any health issues at this time. Would you still encourage us to apply? Uh, so this is Dr. Marsh. So, um, I, I, you know, it's great that you're healthy. That's wonderful news. And what I'd say is uh, if you have not done the Agent Orange registry, that's probably uh, a great uh, thing to do for you to kind of explore whether you have some of the conditions that you just may not know about. Uh, another thing to do would be to discuss with your primary care provider, um, and they may be able to shed some light on some of that as well. Right, and the next question we have is from uh, Michael. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my first question is, when um, if I've already registered on a burn pit registry, do I need to follow up with that? Uh, Along I, with yeah, so this is, sure. So this is Dr. Marceau. Um, 
the registry, uh, the online registry for the airborne hazards is, of course, online. You're, you're welcome to do an in-person uh, exam if you'd like, uh, and that would be to contact the registry department here at the hospital. Um, as far as making claims about it, that would be a separate thing, right? So that would be through the county veteran service officer or directly with the VBA. No, this is if you file a claim, he's asking what, uh, how long does the VBA take? Oh, and okay. from what we know is they're going to start acting on the claims January 1st. Um, I did read here just recently for some folks who are seriously ill, they have already started. But for the general population of people putting in for these benefits, they're going to start on the 1st. I know that they've added several uh, employees to try and do this as quickly as possible, and it is one of the number one priorities, but I have not seen an actual projection because, I, again, a lot of it's probably going to be uh, specific to your claim, but I know they're, they're, they're working as fast as they can. Thanks, Jen. The next question we have is from uh, Michael. Yes, I was aboard the USS America at the uh, final, uh, when they did the signing of the peace treaty, and I had been over there for about 11 and a half months, but I worked in the engine rooms down on the USS America, and we had the air ducts that pulled fresh air from up by the flight deck down into to our department where we could kind of stand under them to, to cool off. And we were about 15 miles off the uh, coastline. And if the wind, wind was blowing in the right direction, we would be pulling some of that toxins down in there. And I wondered if that would come in under, under the PAC Act. And also with that, we had some yard periods where we had to rewrap the lagging around the steam pipes and whatnot. And it appeared like it was in a Christmas snowstorm down there in, in those engine rooms because all those particles of fiberglass were like floating in the air. And I'm wondering if that could have been exposure to the fiberglass particles as well. And if that would come under the PAC Act. So certainly the PAC Act is pretty broad uh, as far as the exposures. Um, I, I believe for Agent Orange, if that's part of it is what I'm hearing from you off of the coast of Vietnam, I think you have to be within 14 nautical miles. Uh, so that's something that you could work with uh, your county veterans uh, officer to see if you you meet that eligibility requirement. Um, separate part of that would be during your active duty that you had some fiberglass um, exposures, and that would be a claim in and of itself um, to say that, hey, you, you believe due to your duties that you had some type of exposure and that there's some type of uh, health condition related to that. And again, that I, I keep saying this, but your county veterans service officers or the VBA will be the route to go as far as making a claim for that, they'd be able to help you uh, navigate those waters. All right. The next question we have is from Gail in Beaver Dam. Uh, Gail, please proceed with the question. Yes, I served in Korea in 5960, and I ran bulldozer quite a bit and a lot of dust. And I'm just curious if Agent Orange was part of Korea in that area where I served, 633rd Engineer Company near Wee John Boo and up near the DMZ. Yes, sir, this is Pam from Eligibility. Um, yes, the DMZ zone is recognized to have had some areas of Agent Orange exposure, but they aren't presumed as with Vietnam because the areas were spotty. It wasn't the entire DMZ. So in order to determine if that applies to you, you would have to go file a claim with the VBA for them to make that determination. It's not presumed for all of Korea as it is with all of Vietnam. Good question. I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Uh, uh, Jerry from Roscoe, are you on the line? Hello? Yes, sir. Please go ahead with your question. Okay. Uh, I guess I've got two questions now. Is hypertension a presumed condition now? Yes. 
Okay, because I got turned down for that. The other thing, I got turned down for uh, neuropathy because I didn't apply right after I got out, which I never even knew what neuropathy was. So can I reapply for that now, too? So there, there's nothing that's going to stop you from reapplying. Um, sometimes they like to, to know that there's new material evidence to make a new claim. Um, the neuropathy is a little tricky. So for Agent Orange exposures, there can be a secondary um, neuropathy related to diabetes, uh, but there's also neuropathy in and of itself related to Agent Orange, but I believe it has to be manifest, so you have to have symptoms within 10 years of service. So these get kind of a little bit in, into too much detail that, for us to talk about here, but so I recommend you talk with your primary care provider and then perhaps your county veteran service officer to explore that one a little bit more. Thanks, Dr. Marsh. And uh, as we're getting toward the end of the call, uh, you know, one of the, the things that we, we really uh, appreciate about these calls is the opportunity to connect with all of you. Um, we also are actively trying to do outreach through a number of different forums, and we wanted to just get a little bit of feedback about how uh, you all are connected uh, with us. Um, so we have a couple more polling questions. It should just take a second. The first is, do you receive email updates from the Madison VA, including our quarterly newsletter? If you could just press one for yes or two for no, that would give us feedback about how many of you guys are signed up um, uh, for our newsletters and email updates. Okay, it looks like about 40%. Um, that's pretty good. And remember, it's easy to sign up to get our news releases, our newsletters, um, and to stay connected with the Madison VA, if you just go to our website, um, at if you Google Madison VA Healthcare, it comes right up. And then if you go to the bottom, there's an opportunity to sign up for those email uh, alerts. We also are, are trying to connect with veterans through Facebook. So we have a quick question about how many of you use Facebook. Uh, the question is, do you have access to Facebook? And if you have, uh, if you answer one, it is yes, and I like the Madison VA page. Two, yes, but I have not liked the Madison VA page, um, and that's just because you haven't been there. Um, or three, no, I do not have access to Facebook. So one uh, is yes, and I like the Madison VA page. Two, yes, but I have not liked the Madison VA page. And three, I don't have access to Facebook. Well, thank you for that response. It's almost like perfectly in thirds here. Uh, so we appreciate all of you that have liked our page. Um, if you're on Facebook, we encourage you to look up the Madison VA or William S. Middleton Memorial VA Hospital and check out that page. There's lots of great information that's coming through. And I don't know that we're necessarily going to use this to promote Facebook. So if you aren't on Facebook, we understand. Uh, and sign up for our email alerts and send through our standard web page. Um, well, thank you all for your feedback and for the very, very many great questions that we got today on PACDAC. Um, I think uh, there were definitely, there's definitely a lot of interest in this subject. I think some takeaways are, you know, continue to explore your benefits. If you have a question, learn. Uh, we encourage you, if you're not uh, connected, to um, enroll uh, in VA care to explore your compens compensation and, <clears throat> and pension benefits uh, and to work with, uh, you know, recognized partners uh, who advocate for you through your county veteran service officers or your VSOs, um, and be careful out there about any potential scams. Um, we really do appreciate uh, all of your time and attention today. There's still almost 300 of you on the call, so thank you for sticking with us for an hour. Um, remember, uh, you can always learn more about the PACT Act at www.va.gov backslash PACT, or you can call us uh, to ask uh, your questions about PACT Act at 800-MY-VA-411 or 800-698-2411. Um, thanks to everyone who was on the call. Thank you for all of the great questions, and thank you to all of our panel members for participating. Have a great afternoon, everybody.